I'm Fiona um, from FarmEd and this is Rosamund Young who I'm very excited to have on the podcast today who's a best-selling author of um, uh, The um, Secret Life of Cows and has a new book coming out called The Wisdom of Sheep um, and also farms nearby here at, um, at, at Kite's Nest which is about sort of I guess half an hour away from, from us isn't it? Um, so, um, so first of all Rosamund tell us about um, your first, the first book that you wrote, which was The Secret Life of Cows, which has been a bestseller, hasn't it? Yeah. Um, okay. how, how did that book come about? How did you start writing that? Well, it's a funny situation. Um, there were four people in my family originally. There's only me now. But I was the only one who didn't want to write a book growing up. My father wrote a few um, plays just for local dramatic societies. My mum had written a couple of books and my brother had got huge plans to write books. He wrote scientific reports and he never got round to writing the books, sadly. I'm wondering if I might better write them for him. But I was the one who never wanted to write a book. But I lived, you know, I worked on the farm and I spoke to people and when they asked me about the cows and sheep, I would always tell them stories about what they'd done. And it seemed perfectly natural to me, just like people tell about their children, how they learnt to open the fridge or climb on something or climb on top of the piano. And then one day somebody said, have you ever thought of writing these stories down? And I said, no. And he said, well, I wish you would. So when he went away, I thought, OK, I'll write down those few stories I've just told him today. And I found I really enjoyed remembering right back to the time I was about two. So I just kept a notebook in the kitchen drawer. And after a meal, I just scribbled down what had happened that day. And eventually it became a book. It took a long time. I wasn't really intending to get anywhere. It just grew and grew. And then he came back and he asked me if I'd done anything. And I said yes. And he published um, three of the stories in the Sunday Telegraph. And then eventually it became a book. And it was published by a very small publisher in 2003. And it just sold X copies and then stopped and I never thought anything else would happen. And 15 years later, I got an email from Faber and Faber in London. They just discovered it and wanted to republish it. And so that seemed like a bonus. And then they sold the translation rights to 24 other countries. So I've got a whole shelf full of books with, with my words written in South Korean and Japanese and Icelandic and every cover's different. And it's really been a very exciting journey because I've been, instead of staying at home with my Wellingtons on all my life, I've been to various parts of the United Kingdom and a couple of places abroad. So it's been fun. Incredible. And your new book is called The Wisdom of Sheep, mm. and um, which I've, I, is fascinating because obviously sheep don't have a great reputation for being <laughs> wise, do they? Everyone, I mean, it's almost an insult to say, oh, you're just like sheep, isn't I it? Know. That you're all just following each other and following the herd. Um, and they're seen as quite dumb, really, aren't they? So That's um, what my thought to start with. But in your book, you talk about how they play hide and seek. And so tell us, tell us about the wisdom of sheep. Well, the title may not be the best title in the world. In the end, we were sort of struggling and arguing and we had to choose something. But one of the people at Faber said, um, you really learn from your sheep, don't you? And he sort of coined the phrase of wisdom for sheep. And in the end, we, we stuck with it. But when we didn't have sheep, I too thought they were stupid. You know, I saw other people's <laughs> sheep and there were hundreds and hundreds in a field. And they would suddenly all run together. And I just didn't want to keep sheep. But then when I got to know a sheep personally, I thought, well, you know, this is different. And I had two orphan lambs, Audrey and Sybil. And Audrey was incredibly clever and Sybil was very stupid. <laughs> so I thought, well, they're just like people, you know, mm. the stupid people and the clever people. It's not, you can't just say sheep, you can't just say people. You can't say policemen or farmers, you know, we're all incredibly individual. So I started to get very interested. And um, it's been a lovely journey because they are very likeable. Some of them are dangerous, not too dangerous, but I was surprised about that. And some, it, maybe after four years of being on the farm and just being anybody, they will come up and just stand by you and look at you and then stroke them like a dog and they just decide to make friends. You can't tell them to. It's up to them. And even a, um, an orphan lamb that you rear, that you think will love you forever, 
they might, or they might decide once you've, once you've weaned them, that's it, I don't want any more to do with you, and it's up to them. So it's really rather nice, you can win their confidence. But one lamb that I reared that I was incredibly fond of called Dandelion, she was incredibly small, and a normal sized lamb teat wouldn't fit in her mouth. I had to feed her with a syringe just for the first two days while I searched online to find a tiny, tiny bottle, which she loved. She went everywhere with me, round the farm, in the Land Rover. But as soon as she was weaned, she's, you know, you know I don't care, and she just walks <laughs> off. And she hardly ever talks to me. She talks to strangers if she likes them. She's a very good judge of character. She, she walks around the farm, she does what she wants. She has her lamb, she walks up, she sits on the road outside the farmhouse, slowing the traffic down. She won't stay in the field because she hates sheep. She <laughs> does, I don't know if she thinks she's a person or a cat or what, but she doesn't like sheep. So she does what she wants. But then a few months ago, I fell off a stool and broke a rib. I didn't know I'd broken a rib. I just thought I'd hurt myself. I was in pain. So I carried on trying to work. And I remember walking out to the farmyard and suddenly I seized up and I could not move an inch without being in real pain. So I stood still for about half an hour. And she came over and she said, are you all right? <laughs> and I said, oh, you do care. <laughs> <laughs> but only if I'm in pain. Oh. So they're, 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 it's fascinating. Yeah. And obviously we get round to the point, you know, people write to me and say, if you love your sheep and you love your cows, how can you eat them? And this is the big, big question. Um, and I have to say, much as I would like never to kill any animal, it feels to me that it is part of the cycle of life, mm. that we wouldn't be able to keep them in any more than tiny numbers if we didn't eat them. Mm. So I concentrate on making sure they're incredibly happy every minute and then take them to the abattoir myself or my partner. And they have as quick a death as you can imagine, probably better than most people will ever mm. get. And um, it, it, it fits in with recycling, with using grass, mm. with people needing... Your farm, it's your kite's, kites nest farm, it's, it's organic, isn't it? And totally organic, farm. and we and only feed animals time. on uh, ruminants on grass. Yeah. We don't actually keep anything else. We have hens, but we don't have pigs. Yeah. And I've had so many friends and relatives who've been ill, and I see how diet affects them so mm. drastically. And I, I love the fact that food can be your medicine. Mm. I don't want to spend my life taking tablets if possible. Mm. So if I can adjust my diet to give me what I need. And we have vegans come to the farm and say, I'm a vegan, I've been a vegan for 40 years, but I want some of your meat because I know I'm short of something. I simply yeah, can't find it. And that's good. Um, mm. They go around the farm and they meet the animals. Years ago, we had um, Alan Long, who was the president of the Vet Vegetarian Society. And I went to enormous trouble to give him a lunch that hadn't got any animal products in. And after going around the farm, he said he wouldn't have minded if they had had because he saw the animals were happy. That's so that lovely. was nice. There's like obviously a connection with Farm Ed, isn't there? Because our kitchen garden here, once a month, um, the people who subscribe to the kitchen garden can also get uh, a meat box from Kite's Nest, can't yeah. they? So there's a, there's a nice connection there with your It's a lovely thing. It squares the circle. Mm. It avoids supermarkets. Mm. And people know where everything comes from. They know where the vegetables are grown here. And they can come to our farm. Some of them have already come and some will come in the future, I hope. Mm. So they can ask any questions and see exactly what we do. Mm. And what we do isn't perfect. We're trying to improve all the time. And if we see someone else doing something better, it's wonderful to learn from them. But the animals do teach us. Mm. They know what they need. They know where they want to be. They know when it's going to rain. They know which way the wind's blowing and they can get shelter, and they know who they want to associate with. <laughs> and our, our old white ram, who's a Hlin breed, is actually ten and a half now. Oh, wow. And he chooses to live with the cows. He, he goes with the sheep for a little while when he has to put them in lamb. But then he wants to go and live with the cows. And he's tiny, <laughs> and they're enormous, and he's in charge. When they go to have hay in the winter, they all stand back and say, after you. And he chooses where he wants to stand. Because if they were to try to push him around, he would run back and he would thump them. And they would never forget. But he doesn't do anything aggressive if he's not pushed out of the way. <laughs> but he had to teach our bull a lesson once, who was like a two-ton bull as against a, 
in a hundred kilogram ram. And he pushed him out of the way repeatedly. So the really? said, okay, <laughs> you know, I think we're equal. We could share that flake of hay, but if you want to push me out of the way, then I'm going to teach you. So he went back 12 paces and he smashed him in the face. And the bull said, you have the hay. <laughs> <laughs> Which is lovely because he's just yeah. absolutely safe. Yeah. But he wants to be treated as an equal. So yeah. that's nice. And he sets the rules. And all the other animals seem, I think word got around <laughs> uh, on the grapevine. And so he has a lovely time most of the year living with the cattle and they all love him and they all treat him with respect, which is nice. That's so lovely. So, so tell me about the process of writing the books then. Do you sort of have ideas when you're walking around the farm or do you sit down at a desk and think, right, now I've got my two hours, I'm going to write. How, how, does, how does it work? Nothing organised. <laughs> I mean, life is like 99% point nine percent farming yeah and washing up of course and then I just keep in my head things that happen sometimes I'm in the field I sit in the Land Rover looking with binoculars just checking on everyone and if something happens or two animals interact that I was surprised liked each other I might make a note in a notebook and then I come home and and write a bit but it's not not organized there's no particular structure I think if I were to give myself a few hours to write, I would completely have a blank head and not know what to write. It's only if I'm under pressure and can scribble something in a diary that something gets written. If I was have the luxury of time, mm. I think my brain would seize up. That's really, that's, really, that's, well, that's, not, that's nice actually, because often people think if you've got to write a book, you've got to sit down and write for days. And um, it's really nice that you, that you produce it while and also... And I couldn't write farming. fiction. I've often thought about writing a novel. I've mm. thought of a few really good titles, but mm. I, I can't think of more than a few lines. <laughs> I can only... I'm like the ghost writer for the animals. If they do oh, something... <laughs> I can write down what I've seen. Mm. And it has to be 100% accurate because I couldn't, I couldn't make up some of the funny things they do. So tell, tell us a, what's, what's one of the funniest stories that you've, that you've um, enjoyed oh. writing? Hard to think just off the top of my head, but... The story that started everything was a, a young heifer called Friendly Wendy, <laughs> who was a bit too thin, we thought. So we thought we'll spoil her a bit. So every afternoon, we'd take her some apples and some hay. And then one day, some visitors came who we didn't expect, and we got so overwhelmed trying to make tea for them, we forgot her. So she climbed out of the field. I have to say, a lot of our fences are not very good. So she managed to jump out of the field. And she saw a man who was in our, rented our holiday cottage. And he was pottering around in the garden. So she walked over and she stared at him, <laughs> watched him all the time. So he knew something was wrong. So he came to the house to tell us and she followed him. And he said to us, um, I spoke to this heifer and I said, I can't work out what you want, but I'll go and consult the authorities on your behalf. And immediately we saw her, we said, oh no, we're so sorry, we forgot you. So we fed her near the house. So every day after that, she came to the house to ask, rather than wait for us, she came to us. And so it's just little things that happen. I mean, sometimes nothing much happens for days. But then you'll see families getting together at night. There's like nine members of one family, all lying within a few inches of each other. And then suddenly you'll see two completely unrelated animals grooming each other and you realize that they're best friends and it's important that they can have the freedom mm. to associate and mothers once they've reared one calf and have a new one they tend to devote most of their time to the new one but there's still a very strong bond with some of them but just like with people some children go to university mm. and only come home twice a year some come home every weekend and some ring or email often and some don't and it's <laughs> They like the freedom to choose, yeah. so it's good. That's so lovely. And why do, you, why do you think, because obviously your books are read really widely, uh, widely sorry, they've been obviously bestsellers. Um, why do you think people who are non-farmers and probably from a non-farming background, what's the, what's the attraction, do you think, of books like yours, which are very farming? I don't oriented? know, but I have this very simplistic view of life and I think everyone should be a farmer. <laughs> so it's not very practical if you're living in a high-rise flat in Bolton. But everybody used to be. Mm. And it's not very long ago no. that you, if you didn't produce your own food, you didn't eat. It's really only a very few generations. 
the Industrial Revolution really ruined all that. Mm. But when you'd got, if you'd got the luxury of having a big piece of land and you could be self-sufficient, that's wonderful. But if you were poor and poor and poor and you were a farm labourer, even then you would probably be allowed to have one row. Mm. If not in your garden, you'd have a strip farming, you'd have a strip in the mm. farmer's field, you'd be allowed to grow a row of potatoes or a few cabbages or something. So you had a little bit of control. But when the Industrial Revolution brought mechanisation and people got out of work and then land was enclosed and nobody was allowed to even keep a goose on the common, they were forced to walk and end up in towns. And then the only work was uh, working for somebody else, Mm. quite often in factories, in big situations, and you lost control of your diet. You had to buy Mm. food or have it in in a canteen. It was brought to you. And that was a crucial step because then you lost, instead of having the time that you might be hoeing your cabbages, you suddenly had something called free time, which Mm. nobody had ever had before. Everybody had to work. They had to rear their children, grow their food, cook their food, eat, look after the animals, walk miles, go and get water. And suddenly you had free time. And then, of course, people misuse that free time. Not everyone. Mm. But I think that's where everything went wrong because... If somebody was going to write a book, read a book, do the garden, look after their mother, that's fine. But if they'd got free time and they didn't know what to do with it, then they were going to maybe walk around the streets and maybe mug somebody. I don't know. Mm. But I think it's... We say every day when we hear of terrible things going on, if those people who've just committed some terrible act of violence, if they had sheep to look after, they wouldn't have time (laughs) or energy to go and kill somebody. Mm. So... It's a big, it's, big problem. So you think the attraction is almost harking back to a simpler life when, when we all kind of remember in some sort of ancestral way of when we were all on the land. And, I hope so. Yeah. I think it's it is idea, in everybody. It? There's mm. a lot of people who wish they could get back to mm. the land. And I've had hundreds of letters and emails, mostly from young women, mm. who just say, I love cows for no particular reason. <laughs> and most of them have been to the farm and been to stay and one but they've all been interesting in different ways and they couldn't really put their hand finger on why they just felt drawn Mm. to cows but one girl was a particular interest and she said all she wanted to do was to get near a cow and just sit there well most of our cows don't particularly want that to happen (laughs) we we had a job to find they'd get bored and they walk Mm. off but it turned out that she'd had a very very hard life she'd been abused by her father from the age of three and she wasn't able to articulate or get away she was terrified and she just had this vision and she made a tiny model of a cow with a little girl tucked in safe sheltered by the cow and she just thought if she could get in that situation she'd be safe yeah and eventually she trained as a therapist to help other people in the same situation and that helped her because she totally understood what they'd been through. Mm. But it took her till she was nearly 50 before she could get any sort of peace. Goodness. So it's, um, cows have a, Thera- a presence. Therapeutic, yeah. Um, yeah. Which I don't really know as much about as other people because I've never not been with mm. cows. <laughs> I can't imagine quite how I would have felt mm. if I'd lived in a town. But I do think it's in... in in, in our ancestry, mm. yes, for all of us. Some, mm. We've all got you. Everybody who lives in a town has got a great, 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 great grandfather who was a farmer oh, or yeah, a farm I've, labourer I've or a horse dealer. Family tree, and it's, it's full of agricultural labour. So I yeah. just think, well, you know, we've, we all have farming backgrounds, don't we, even though if it's not that. I think recent. town life is incredibly mm. artificial mm. and temporary. Um, and I don't think there was as much mental illness in the past. There probably wasn't time, or perhaps it wasn't recognised, but, Mm. I mean, poor John Clare, the poet, he was a farm labourer and he wrote the most superb poetry, but he was considered insane because Mm. farm labourers don't write poetry. Mm. And he had a desperately difficult Mm. time and he was locked up in an institution. Mm. So I think it's just natural, Mm. Mm. but a lot of people don't have access, so it's tricky. But people can come and stay at Kite's Nest, can't they? You've got... Um... We have lots of people come, yeah. Yeah. But it's only a very small, you know, we yeah. can't... 
we can't solve the problems can, of the you world. Can, people can read your books, obviously, and um, and yeah. and they can come. And so we, we, you're going to be a guest at the Farm Med Lit Fest, Lit Fest um, on the 11th of May. So people can come and and actually hear all about um, your life with cows and sheep and, and other animals, and and your writing process. So that'd be be really exciting to have you um, to hear more stories from Rosamond um, at the Lit Fest. That'll be fantastic. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And uh, it's been lovely to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you.